The U.S. Department of Energy is cleaning up the Oak Ridge Reservation of residual hazardous and radioactive contamination left over as a result of decades of nuclear energy research. Much of that work has been influenced by the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board, a citizens panel that provides independent advice and recommendations on DOE's cleanup operations. You're welcome to attend the meetings and be part of this important work. For more information, call us or visit our website. Um, I have a few preliminary announcements. Um, please make sure that uh, from the board standpoint and from the public standpoint, use the microphones uh, when we speak. Uh, if there's any questions, we use the uh, placards uh, so that uh, we can uh, orderly call on each other uh, to answer or, or uh, pull questions. Uh, there is a protocol that the board will ask the first questions uh, of the speaker uh, and uh, the public will uh, then uh, be able to use the microphone after that. Uh, voting on motions, there are currently 19 members, so we certainly have a, a quorum. Uh, we need 10 for approval of any motion. Uh, coming up, uh, coming meetings. Uh, in, June 9th is our next uh, meeting here. Uh, the June 9th, the, the topic will be ongoing groundwater efforts. Uh, the, uh, there may be a, a change in uh, venue, for, excuse me, a change in, in topic, uh, depending upon what Dave Adler's uh, uh, schedule is going to be, but uh, we are going to have that meeting uh, here on uh, June 9th. Uh, there is no May, May meeting due to the DOE com uh, Community Budget Workshop. Uh, you're all invited, uh, and please may, uh, let uh, Shelley know, board members, if you're going. Uh, we have, we're going to have uh, meeting uh, name tags and uh, space for everybody from the board up front. Uh, that budget workshop will be from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Wednesday, May 9th. 2018 in building 24, 2014G conference room. Directions are in your meeting packet. It's the last page of your meeting packet. It's the same place the budget workshop was last year, uh, for those of you that did attend. Um, there's plenty of parking on both ends of that. There's a series of uh, three buildings in a row, and it's the middle building uh, of the three that are sitting over there. If you have any questions about that, uh, ask any of us that have been there before or uh, Shelley uh, for directions. But the, the map on the back is pretty close, self-explanatory. If you got any questions about that, uh, let us know. With that, we'll hit the agenda. Dave's going to present the student plaques. And Having students participate in this board is really important to the board's success. And it's a really a pleasure to have you guys. Uh, of course, we're about to lose a couple and hopefully gain a couple. Um, this meeting is the last time for our two uh, current student members, Cameron Niemeyer, who's from Hardin Valley Academy, and Chloe Nussbaum, who's from Oak Ridge High School. We very, very much appreciate the time you guys have devoted to participating with the board in the monthly board meetings and the uh, EM Stewardship Committee meetings also. And, of course, for par participating in all the Oak Ridge Reservation tours that you've made time for. On behalf of DOE, I'd really like to thank you for everything you've done with the board. Um, as student representatives to the SSAB, in, appreci in appreciation of your efforts, we've got a couple plaques we'd like to send you, and I guess we take pictures now. Is that mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And last, but certainly not least, um, Chloe's not here, mm -mm. right, so we'll have to get Chloe's black to her. Um, Pete, where are you? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Pete has been with us for 20 years, and I remember every one of them. <laughs> um, this is a big loss. It's a big loss. We'll survive it, but Pete has been a real key participant in the board's activities. Um, he's made us work harder. He's made me work harder. Am I not coming through? Okay. Um, Pete has made me work harder and made me do my job better. And I really, really appreciate everything Pete has done to help this board out. Um, we wish you the best life possible from here on out. Um, I, I, 
couldn't begin to list all the things Pete has done to make this board more successful over the years. He's really been key to it. So it's a tough act to follow, Pete. Very tough. Very much appreciate the time you spent with us. And now we get to plaque you. <laughs> 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 it's all about the plaque. <laughs> <laughs> the shirt's two we're years. Shake hands and share the plaque, okay? okay? So oh, oh. Like okay, I think I know this drum on it. Yeah. Last official act. I would just like to say, and I'm going to use the microphone because I do know the drill, um, <laughs> that it really has been an honor working with such a wonderful group of community-minded people. You guys are really great. You really do inspire me or have inspired me through your service to the board. I just want to thank all of you and all the members of the board for the past 20 years because really you have been an inspiration. Keep on doing what you do. You're doing great. Thanks and good luck to you all. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Jay's not here tonight <clears throat> because he's participating in a collection of things in D.C. Every year in D.C. there's what's called the cleanup caucus meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nobody does spring like East Tennessee, but it does come with a good pollen count. <laughs> um, Jay is meeting basically with each of the uh, Jays of the different sites around the country and generally with their elected congressional representatives for the purpose of understanding where the budget is, where the programs are, and ensuring their collective interests are best met. So it's an important time. It's important for us for budget. So that's why Jay's there and not here. I didn't have a lot of comments for tonight other than to re really express my thanks for everyone who's come out to hear about this topic. It's one of the most important ones for the cleanup program, making sure that we have a place to take the less contaminated waste that we generated is critical to the success of this cleanup program. So Brian's going to spend some time talking to you about that. Also, I'd want to reiterate that this budget meeting that's coming up, I can't remember the date. What, what did you say it was, Dennis? May 11th is, is an important one. Um, we're at kind of a critical time in the growth of the Oak Ridge cleanup program. We're basically finishing up cleanup at K-25 or East Tennessee Technology Park more recently. Um, that cleanup is done with a, if you will, a color of money. It comes from a certain funding source that we will no longer have access to once we complete cleanup at ETTP. We have to shift to another source of money. I won't walk you through all the terminology, but it's a pot of money that there's a lot of competition for. It's the same pot of money that all of the other sites access to get cleaned up. We've kind of had our had a, had a good run using what's called D&D &D funding for ETTP. We only have to compete with two other sites for that. Now we're competing with the balance of the complex. So, you know, may, may we do well? I think we will, but it requires that we start getting a lot more of that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding how we get our money, coming to a common consensus on how to spend it, what priorities to spend the money on, um, is key to faring well in the budget battle. Um, we've done well uh, this year in 2018. We actually finally now have a real budget to finish off the last of the year. We're supposed to get it in October, but that's, it's not worked well for the past several years. We just recently got our final 2018 numbers, and we did very well. Um, in addition to working on this landfill project, Brian has a lot of money he has to safely and successfully spend. Just got a plus up in FY18 of about $125 million to start tearing down that big red brick building over at Y-12 called the Biology Building. So 18's good. We've gotten a good plus up in this new color of money. It's called defense funding. We'd like to be able to sustain it. So we're very interested in people participating in the budget meeting that's coming up. The building that Dennis was referring to, for anybody that has, uh, just to make sure you can find it, the big federal building, they call it the big white castle on the Oak Ridge Turnpike. That's the building that we all work in. Just behind that building is the 2714 building. It's a series of yellowish buildings. They look kind of like old barracks because they probably used to be old mm. barracks. <laughs> um, that's where you want to go. Park in the parking lots behind the federal building and at those buildings. And we look forward to seeing all of you there.
So as many as can attend anyway. That's all I have for tonight. Connie? I only have um, at least one announcement, understanding that Water management has been a great concern here at the Oak Ridge Reservation and wanted everyone to know that we are working very diligently with DOE and the state to come up with a, a strategy to address the water problems here and the discharges specifically at ETTP. We are trying to get things working and then once we kind of figure out a strategy to address that, we will kind of move that to the other projects. But I wanted the board to know that we are really working very hard to try to come up with a consensus approach to dealing with the water. I have no other announcements, but I would be more than happy to try to answer questions if asked. Okay. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Michael Higgins from. Uh, good evening. Uh, I am uh, taking Christoph's place uh, tonight. Um, a couple of things, as Connie and Dave said, uh, a couple of large issues. Uh, we're working on the uh, new proposed uh, waste disposal facility. That's a high priority for uh, all three of the par uh, parties involved. Uh, also, the uh, water discharge issues, we're working uh, closely with both uh, other entities to work through those issues. Uh, do have, uh, want to make the board aware, we've had several uh, personnel changes uh, at TDEC recently that uh, do affect uh, some of the work here on the reservation. Um, you may know that uh, Commissioner Martineau uh, is stepping down at the end of this month. Uh, it was just announced a few days ago, and uh, Deputy Commissioner Sherry McGreblian will, will be stepping into the uh, commissioner's role. Uh, with those changes, also we have uh, Steve Goins, uh, who's the Director of Division of Remediation in Nashville, uh, is retiring uh, June 15th. And uh, Chris Thompson, who currently is the deputy director uh, here in Oak Ridge, will be moving uh, into uh, Steve's position as the director of remediation. Uh, with that change, uh, Colby Morgan here in Oak Ridge will be stepping in as the uh, TDEC uh, Oak Ridge office manager in Chris's place. So I do have a number of changes of personnel that will be affecting uh, some of the work here. So you, you'll probably be seeing some new faces uh, over the coming months. Um, that's all I've got, unless there's questions. Thank you, Michael. This is the public comment period. The public comment period is now open, but I don't think we have any comments signed up. So as a citizen's advisory board to the Department of Energy on environmental cleanup, we want to encourage the community at large to attend and participate in our board and committee meetings. If you are unable to attend, please send in your questions and comments to the address shown. Appropriate comments and questions will be read during the public comment section of the SSAB meeting and will be given the same consideration by the board and DOE as those given in person. Meeting schedules and ways to communicate with the board can be obtained by calling 241-4583 or by visiting our website. Okay, so our, our presenter this evening is Brian Henry. Um, Brian was named Y12's Portfolio Federal Project Director in 2016. Mm -hmm. This is the role he oversees all of the planning and execution for Y12's current and upcoming cleanup projects, including all decontamination, demolition, and disposal operations. In this role, he is also leading preparations for the Mercury Treatment Facility and the Environmental Management Disposal Facility two of OREM's largest and most vital near-term capital projects. Prior to his selection, Mr. Henry was OREM's Senior Project Manager for the Environmental Management Disposal Facility, and he also served as the Interim Portfolio Federal Project Director for Y12. Before jo joining OREM, uh, Brian served as the Chief of the Reservation Management Branch at DOE's Oak Ridge office, and he also led its reindustrialization program. Mr. Henry has more than 20 years of federal experience working on complex facility and utility projects, including time he spent as a civilian employee for the Navy and the Air Force. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Tennessee Technological University, and he is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. All right. So... Tonight, um, I'm going to start off by giving you a broader overview of all of our on-site disposal facilities and the, our current efforts and our planning efforts to make sure that we have enough disposal capacity 
um, to support cleanup, not only today, but going into the future. So we're fortunate um, here in Oak Ridge to have a, a number of on-site disposal facilities, and those range from um, permitted landfills with, with TDEC uh, for construction demolition debris to kind of like industrial waste to the landfills that take the low-level radioactive waste and hazardous waste associated with the cleanup under the Comprehensive Environmental Compensation and Liabilities Act. And I'm going to say CERCLA from here on out instead of saying that big long word. But um, the sanitary industrial landfills are permitted by the state of Tennessee um, in the Division of Solid Waste Management. And our current operating uh, low-level waste facility called the Environmental Management Waste Management Facility and our future planned uh, facility, waste disposal facility, the Environmental Management Disposal Facility, are, are both regulated under CERCLA, and we work very closely with both EPA and TDEC on all actions associated with those facilities. So all of the landfills and disposal facilities have what are called waste acceptance criteria. So as projects generate waste, and they do characterization of the waste, and then we look at the different options for disposal and make sure that the waste is going into the right landfill and meets the landfill. By volume, about more than 90% of our, our waste from our cleanup efforts go into our on-site disposal facilities. By hazard, more than 90% of the hazard goes off-site to off-site facilities. All right, I'm going to try to use this pointer and try not to point at anyone. Um, I actually do love the map on the back of the wall, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the map and the locations of all the sites, but you guys have an excellent map on the back of the wall. But essentially, the Oak Ridge Reservation is outlined in purple. It's about 34,000 acres, and there are basically three main industrial sites. You've got the East Tennessee Technology Park, as Dave mentioned, we're approaching the end of cleanup at that site, and as I'll mention in a little bit, our existing um, low-level waste landfill environmental management waste management facility can basically handle all the waste from that site. Um, we're going to be shifting our efforts to the Y-12 National Security Complex and also clean up at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And to make sure that we can efficiently and effectively do that cleanup over the next several decades, we, we need a new on-site disposal facility. I'm still pretending like it's working, so, okay. So this is a close-up of Y-12, and most of our existing facilities are in the neighborhood and vicinity, either on Y-12 or close to Y-12 um, National Security Complex. So I've, we've shown operational facilities here and closed facilities. So we have our Permitted landfills that number from one through seven, three is missing. That one got started but never quite made it, so there is no landfill three. Uh, landfill four is here, five and seven are there, and I'll talk a little bit more about what each, what types of waste each one received here in a second. Um, a closed landfill next to the EMWMF, and a couple of closed landfills just south of, of Y12. So this just kind of gives you a summary uh, of the different landfills we have and, and what general types of waste that, that each one takes. So we start with um, construction demolition debris. If it's non-hazardous, non radiological um, basically mostly clean building debris and construction debris, it goes in our construction debris landfill number seven. That one is, oh, that one right there, and it is permitted by TDEC. We also have two industrial landfills that are basically the next step, and so they can take, you know, minor amounts of contamination and a broader range of debris, and that's landfill four and five. They're essentially constructed the same way, can take the same types of waste, but landfill four basically can handle classified wastes. So, you know, if we get some sensitive waste streams, they'll go to four instead of five, but but basically it's... it's um, office waste, equipment, construction, debris, and just your normal, you know, some normal um, trash from, from either the Y-12 or r &L will also go into these industrial landfills. And then we get into our 
hazardous waste landfills that are, are handled under CERCLA. And right now our existing one is called the Environmental Management Waste Management Facility, as I mentioned. And it can accept basically low-level uh, radioactive contamination, some, some mixtures of hazardous waste, and that actually goes into PMWMF. Um, you know, when we're doing the cleanup across the Oak Ridge Reservation, if you think about it, you know, we start by cleaning out a building. And so you'll have, you know, loose equipment, loose materials, some personal protective equipment, and that will be kind of the first waste stream associated with cleanup. Then when you get the building all cleaned out, you're going to take down the building. And then so you have a lot of debris associated with demolition of the facility. And then that has a particular, you know, that's the next waste stream. And then we get to basically the slabs and soils, which, you know, to finish up the cleanup under CERCLA, we, we clean up and we'll have a waste stream from soils and, and concrete slabs. So those are the basic types of waste that go to the different landfills as we clean up the Oak Ridge Reservation. We do have a hierarchy of, of what we try to do with materials and, and waste. First and foremost, as we're cleaning up the buildings and taking out equipment and materials, our preference would be to recycle those. So we would start looking at it, says, is there, is there anything that's fairly clean that can be reused? Um, and then we would try to recycle that material. Um, if it can't be recycled, then uh, in order of, of strategic preference, we would go to our construction demolition debris. And as I mentioned before, we have a waste acceptance criteria. So the project will, will sample and characterize the waste and then the determination will be made on, on which landfill is appropriate. And then if it can't go in the construction demolition debris landfill because it has some minor contamination, maybe it's friable asbestos or some other things, then we go in the industrial landfills. And then if you get into you know, some uh, low-level radioactive contamination or some hazardous um, chemicals, then it would go into EMWMF. Now, if you start getting into significantly higher activities or more hazardous chemicals, then that basically goes, to, goes off site. So I, I talked about our existing facility. Um, it opened for, well, our, our permitted landfills have been open for decades. They've been out there for a while. And we basically have enough permitted capacity on those to, to um, for you know decades to come. We do build out sections of that as we need it. And um, we recently built out a couple of areas in, in the sanitary landfills, and we're capping another area this year in the landfill four. Um, we also, for the environmental management waste management facility, we built that out as we needed it. It's basically you know we constructed the last. The original construction was in 2002. And the most recent construction uh, was finished uh, a few years ago, cell six. So it's, it's at its constructed capacity, and it's about 75% full. And as I mentioned earlier, as we're finishing up the cleanup of DTTP, that will mostly fill EMWMF. Um, it has a capacity of about 2.2 million cubic yards. We are working with EPA and TDAC uh, about doing a, a change to the cap, which would allow us to put a little more waste into EMWMF, but that's not been finalized yet. So, um, as Dave mentioned, you know, we are starting the transition from cleaning up ETTP to cleaning up Y12 and ORNL. We've been fortunate enough over the last few years for Congress to give us um, monies to start going after some excess facilities, excess contaminated facilities, and do some work out there, um, both at Y12 and ORNL. And a lot of that work will help us get to the major work that much sooner, as will the additional monies, like Dave mentioned, that Congress has started giving us starting in 18. Uh, we received $125 million for the, the uh, biology complex that will allow us to finish that entire area and clean up the soils underneath. That takes about three or four years. Um, and if we continue getting money, that will allow us to move into more facilities at ORNO and Y12. So to be successful and to make sure that our program as a whole can continue to be successful, we need to get a new um, low-level radioactive waste circular landfill up and operational. Um, that's called the EMDF. We, as Mike mentioned earlier, um, we are working, uh, having lots of meetings um, to try to come to agreement on the proposed plan. Um, I think in past meetings we've talked about we were in some various levels of dispute. 
An agreement was signed in December of 2017, allowing us to exit dispute and to have a solid path forward to get to a proposed plan this summer and a record of decision in early 2019. Part of that agreement involved us going out and doing some characterization of the preferred site, which was Central Bear Creek Valley. And I will kind of show you where we are. Of course, this is the whole reservation. Um, essentially, when we were planning for a new site, just like when we were planning for the existing EMWMF, we looked at sites all across the Oak Ridge Reservation. And the, the topography is such that here in East Tennessee, and particularly on the, the reservation, it's a ridge valley system. So you'll have a significant ridge, then you'll have a valley, then a significant ridge, and then another valley. And Bear Creek Valley is here, and um, Bethel Valley is here, and then down here is Melton Valley. So we looked at all the different valleys and came to the conclusion that Bear Creek Valley is the right location for, for our on-site disposal facilities. And we further narrowed that down to options throughout uh, Bear Creek Valley. We looked at an option on the east side of Bear Creek Valley. We looked at an option in the center, and we looked at an option on the west. We also um, looked at some option, options where we basically built two small facilities, um, and that was part of our consideration. After all the discussions and working with the regulators over the last few years, uh, we've centered on a site in central Bear Creek Valley, And basically, part of, of our challenge when we're sodding a new landfill is there's a lot to take into consideration. You've got to take in consideration topography, geology, hydrology, land use, um, and lots of other factors. In, in working with the state and EPA, one of the most important considerations that came out was trying to, to site a landfill between existing tributaries. So if you can imagine ridges and valleys, nature has kind of set up a drainage mechanism. And so all along the ridges, there are tributaries that the surface water goes to. That collects and goes to the center of the valley, kind of to Bear Creek Valley, and then that kind of flows west to east. So on this map, you see what are called NT, NT11, NT10, NT12. Those are basically uh, tributaries draining water from the ridge. And so we worked with the state and EPA to site about a 2.2 million um, cubic yard facility in between the tributaries to avoid having a, trib a former tributary under the waste. Um, and this is at the conceptual stage. One thing we did, you know, we're also very fortunate to have a haul road. So we have a haul road that is out of the public commerce and it's on the reservation so that all the waste that comes from ETTP, all the waste that comes from ORNL, and all the waste that comes from Y12 can travel to these sites without going in, out into the public. Um, this Central Bear Creek Valley site will require us to reroute the Hall Road just south of that. And then there's Bear Creek Road, which is a, a paved road that's used for access to, to Y12 and other facilities, will also have to be rerouted. Um, this basically just shows the, out, the outline in, of the conceptual cell and some sediment basins for, for construction. It's basically just a conceptual design. Um, but that's, as I mentioned, that's in Central Bear Creek Valley. If anyone is familiar with the Spallation Neutron Source at o the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, it's just north of that. Um, next slide. So I mentioned earlier, we also, you know, as part of the agreement to move forward for EMDF, we agreed to go out and put some, some uh, piezometers in at Central Bear Creek Valley site so we could get a better understanding of the groundwater. We agreed to go out and collect some information on the surface water. That included observations of seeps and springs and also installation of some surface water flumes so we can get a better understanding of how that whole system behaves. All of that work was completed. Um, in the March time frame, and we're now collecting data uh, from all those efforts. And the plan is to take all of that information and some analysis and put it in a, a technical memorandum, and that will be part of the administrative record and will be available when the proposed plan comes out to the public. And it, I'm sorry, that, that just shows some of the, the drill rigs on, on those sites. So um, we drilled 
Let me make sure I get this right. I think 16 piezometers, and those were done in eight pairs. So we would drill a, a, a deep piezometer, and then close to that, we would drill a, a shallow piezometer. And the idea is so we can better understand how the different layers interact. We also tested the hydraulic, hydraulic conductivity of, of the different layers and get a better understanding of bedrock and a lot of other um, features. But this is basically the um, pictures of the drill rigs. All right, next. So, you know, as Dave mentioned and as I mentioned, we have decades worth of work ahead of us um, to clean up Oak Ridge and ORNL. We currently have a very supportive Congress in giving us funding for accomplishing that work. And one of the keys to ensuring we continue to be successful and continue to get that funding is getting a new on-site disposal facility up and running. And we, we basically need it in place and operational about two years before our existing one gets full. If you can imagine all the different waste streams, some waste streams are better placed on the floor of a cell. And so as the other one fills up and you're near the top, you don't really want those wastes to go up there. You need the new one open so you can put that waste on the floor of the new one. Um, we're at an exciting time. You know, this summer we will be issuing a public comment and we will be accepting um, comments. And basically as part of the process, we'll take all the comments received during the, during the public comments on the proposed plan. DOE, EPA, and TDEC will all get together and we'll talk about those comments. And then responses to all those comments will go into the, the record of decision. Um, I think that's it. Now we're to the questions. Are there any questions for Brian? Oh, one for you. As you get rid of the uh, Hall roads uh, and uh, reroute uh, the standard road, where will that waste go? Well. Uh, our plan for doing that would be would continue to be operational. So, the the sequencing is essentially, you know, we would construct the part of the road that doesn't affect the haul road, and then try to minimize the outage necessary to tie the two together. And that would be the case for both roads. But you're going to end up tearing up the old haul road after the after yeah. the reroute is mm -hmm. is in place. Yes, yeah. we would we would the project will construct over the footprint of the old road. But we would have the new traffic flow established. Part of our planning going forward is, you know, it will take us several years to, to finalize design and get to the actual construction of the sale. Um, we're pursuing in DOE space what's called approval to do early site preparation. And, and a key piece of that is to go ahead in, in potentially FY19 or FY20 and do those road reroutes so that we have those done well ahead of time, and then when we get to where we have a good final design, and EPA and TDEC have all signed off on the design and we're ready to start construction, that part's out of the way and we can focus on constructing the cell. Very good, thank you. Ed. Yeah, thank you, great presentation. I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, the, uh, the industrial landfill four, I guess, mm -hmm. that accepts classified waste, that's only if it is not uh, contaminated, right, or that's, hazardous. That's correct. If it is hazardous, it goes to? Yeah, e the Environmental Management Waste Management Facility also accepts classified waste. So, you know, if, if it's low enough level and, and non-hazardous and non-radioactive, it would go to the industrial classified landfill. If it um, has low-level <coughs> hazards, it would go to the Environmental Man Waste Management Facility. And if it has significant activity or significant hazards, we also have off-site disposal facilities that take classified waste. The other one I have is uh, in terms of the recycling and the reuse mm -hmm. of uh, waste or byproduct, how successful have we been in Oak Ridge? Um, I don't have the numbers on that. Um, I know there are some good success stories. Um, so, I, I mean, we can go back and try to get some info. Dave may have yeah. a better answer to that one. <laughs> I'll try. Um, first of all, it, it's very hard to recycle materials that come from a contaminated environment. So in terms of taking materials that are 
taken from a building that suffers from some contamination. It's very tricky to do that. We actually have a moratorium in place that prevents us from recycling contaminated metals because we don't want to unintentionally introduce contaminated metals into the commercial public. You know, we don't want our contaminated steel beam showing up as a you know, a child's toy or something like that, because other recycling can take place. So most of our successful recycling is paper, other ways of that sort. When we take down a building that is known to be completely uncontaminated, then that is an opportunity for recycling. Um, we do have numbers, and it certainly amounts to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of material that we reclaim some value for. But we still, unfortunately, do have to rely very heavily on just straight-out disposal of a lot of material because it's prohibited to recycle it, or it's prohibitively expensive to recycle it. You would spend so much money surveying it and cleaning it to enable its recycling that it's much, much cheaper just to go and make new steel or whatever it is. So we've got numbers. Um, we can round them up. In fact, I'll, I'll take an action to come up with some numbers on the volumes that we do recycle. And lastly, uh, on, that, on that proposed site for the, for the new... Uh, waste disposal facility uh, on the southeast extreme is there a is there going to be some sort of a little problem in terms of uh, rerouting one of those little springs or the tributaries yeah um you know that's that's part of what the characterization um tells us i think you know our plan our conceptual plan is we will reroute the surface so with those tributaries you got to deal with surface water flow primarily and then any potential groundwater impacts. So the plan is to reroute the stream so that you have good uh, diversion channel for all the surface water flow. And then we'll put in, um, we, for the conceptual design, there's a temporary drainage feature that would go under the, the berm or the edge of the landfill that would help drain that, that area as, as we're putting on and constructing and putting a liner on it. Because once you get the liner constructed and the site constructor constructed, that essentially is cutting off the recharge to that area. So the conceptual design has us both rerouting and having a temporary drainage fe feature on the outskirts to help initially, you know, reduce the, the groundwater and divert the surface water. And lastly, do we have a number as far as dollars for that? For the overall, um, so from, from in DOE space, uh, for a project space, our range for the project, uh, for the construction piece of the project is, let me see if I can get this right, 175 to 355 million. And that's construction of all of the, um, the landfill in phases plus all of the um, support facilities. Yeah. That does not include the, the final cap, which would be you know, decades out in the future. Uh, life cycle cost, when you factored in the cap and all the operations, uh, I may get this wrong, but I think the life cycle cost is 600, 700 million. I'd have to go back and verify that figure. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. John? In terms of the Hall Road, there's been some talk about, I guess, when ETTP is completed, and doing away with the Hall Road uh, west of the site. Uh, is does it, this location have any impact on the decision on what to do with that any way or the other? No, the, so the way the Hall Road is laid out, um, basically you have the portion that comes from ETTP, and then you have a road that comes from ORNL that comes into the Hall Road, and then you have a Hall Road from Y12. So this location is in between the Hall Road from ORNL and Y12. Um, so the, the piece that's, you know, between the ORNL road and ETTP will not be impacted. The decision on what to do with that would not be impacted by this location. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Bonnie. Let me back up just a little bit, but the, the selection of this site was, there were other sites considered too. That's correct. Correct, and so, the selection of this site was based on the groundwater? So the, um, it, it was a long process with a lot of factors going in. So um, the shift from the East Bear Creek Valley site to this Central Bear Creek Valley site, I would say is primarily driven by the hydrology. 
Um, and so, you know, this is a site where we can build a, so it's, and when I say hydrology, it's not only those surface water tributaries, but, you know, there's also Pine Ridge to the, to the back. And um, the, East Bear, the East Bear Creek Valley site was more up against the ridge. This site actually allows you to have a good separation from the ridge too. So it's hydrologi hyd hydrologically um, separated from the ridge. It basically has surface water drainage all around it so that you know you have drainage paths for for all the surface water. And the tributaries are <clears throat> are they blue line streams or I'm they sure are. I'm sure G Tech's on top of that. Yes, yeah. And and those tributaries, you know, depending on the time of the year and the wet season, they right. may have pretty good flow. When we get into the driest part of the year they may have um, no flow. Right. Okay. Any other questions? I have one more for you. Okay. Uh, the uh, runoff that comes off of the current uh, waste disposal mm -hmm. site, uh, we deal with that at a, at a facility. Uh, is there going to be a tie-in from the runoff from this particular waste site into that same facility, or are you going to tank a, a wagon it over? Or? So the conceptual um, design for the new facility includes a water treatment system as part of the design. So the plan there was, was to actually build a system there on site. Oh, yes, Richard. Yes, you mentioned um, uh, proposing building the hall road before you have the approval for the, uh, to site the landfill there, right? How much time will that save in your schedule if you go ahead and complete the preliminary or however far you, you're able to go with the preparing the hall road? So, the, you know, we're in the conceptual planning stage, so I'm just going to kind of give a range. I, I think doing some of the, you know, we're looking at, at some schedule recovery and doing some things in parallel to try to, to bring the, the, the schedule back to the left and be able to open sooner. I would estimate at this point with the limited information available, that, that doing that early work should buy us three to six months in schedule. Okay, okay. A follow-up, a follow-up if you want. Okay. Does Good. that, uh, does that mean, are we behind the schedule? Um, I think at this point, you know, we're okay in schedule, uh, okay in schedule space. You know, a lot of it depends on, you know, when EMWF is, is going to get full. When EMWF is going to get full really depends on how much funding we get year after year and how much cleanup is accomplished. You know, right now we're projecting EMWF to be full in the mid-2020s. Um, and right now I think our projection for, for getting EMWF up and op I mean, EMDF up and operational is about 2024. And I mentioned we'd like to have a two-year overlap so so we're probably not quite at a two-year overlap um, so we're looking at ways we potentially could could bring that forward and, and the the key driver to getting it open sooner rather than later is to minimize the programmatic risk that that's associated with it. if we continue to get you know this year we got 640 million dollars in funding for Oak Ridge if we see those numbers steadily over the you know next three to five years that means we need to be open sooner rather than later. If we're at the $400 million budget range for the next three to five years, we have a little more breathing room. So, you know, looking at bringing it to the left is, is primarily about minimizing programmatic risk to make sure that we are ready and, and are successful if Congress shows us the money, so to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Are there questions from the uh, public? There's a microphone up here. <coughs> when, uh, when the Hall Road was being con considered 20 years ago or so, uh, Gerald Boyd told me personally that, uh, that once the uh, ETTP was finished with the cleanup, the Hall Road would be returned to Greenfield. 
Is that is that still the plan? I may let Dave answer this one. Actually, the uh, record of decision and the, the the permission documents that enable the construction of that haul road call for it being bladed and reverting to nature. So unless that deci decision is changed, that is what will occur. We have in our budget in the out years money to do all that work. Now it is possible it could change. There have been um, some folk who have expressed interest in possibly maintaining the road for recreational purposes. Um, it's possible that there could be some value in retaining a road between ETTP and Oak Ridge National Lab for, for other reasons, some economic development opportunity. But as it stands right now, that is the decision, and there's no initiative underway to change that decision. So that's the plan. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> oh, yes. Could you use the microphone? Okay. Yes, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, what's the uh, end use designation for the Central Bear Creek Valley site? That's an excellent question. Um, so right now, I think the so I'm going to I think I'm going to get this right. But there in Bear Creek Valley for cleanup purposes and future land use assumptions, we have industrial, recreational, and unrestricted. And the Central Bear Creek Valley site is in the zone one that's zoned for recreational. Um, as part of this and. The proposed plan talks about this. If this becomes the site, then we would undergo um, and change the the Bear Creek Valley record of decision to shift that to industrial future use. They didn't the secure transport people at the ETP at one time say they might have an interest in a haul road after. They had brought that up, but that interest seems to have waned. Um, we, we go to NNSA, the, the folk who run Secure Transport and the Y-12 plant, and have asked them, do they want us to hand management of the, of the road over to them for their use? And they have not expressed an interest, at least not recently, in taking over that road. So you know, I want to stop short of saying it would never happen, because anything could happen. But at, at this point, no one has expressed an interest in, convert, in, in preserving the road. Um, and we do have a decision that says we will abandon the road and allow it to revert to nature. So much of the road actually travels, so I don't know what fraction of its distance, perhaps half of it, travels underneath power line cuts. So reverting to nature is probably a little bit too strong because that area is maintained for purposes of maintaining the power lines. But there certainly are some sections of the road that weave through forest and that would become forest again. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. There's an issue group that uh, had signed up uh, for the ongoing uh, waste disposal uh, capacity. Uh, they include uh, Bales, Burroughs, Holden, Shields, Shoemaker, Tap, Thomas, and Trujillo. But, uh, there will be uh, the uh, EM stewardship meeting uh, coming up. Uh, where we'll be discussing this. So uh, please, uh, if you've signed up for this uh, topic, uh, please consider how we move forward with uh, any uh, recommendations and join us in that meeting. We'll go to the committee reports. Uh, Fred Swindler with the EM Stewardship Committee. Our last uh, uh, EM Stewardship Committee uh, meeting was uh, held on the, uh, February 28th. It goes back a little ways because we didn't have a a meeting in March. Uh, the discussion centered on the uh, uh, Oak Ridge Engineering, uh, uh, Oak Ridge Environmental Management Excess Contaminated Facilities, uh, which was presented by Brian Henry and Bill McMillan. Uh, it was a, a really a follow-up uh, discussion to uh, the, the board meeting that was held previously. There were a number of questions. Uh, I'll just go through a few of those questions for you. Uh, one, although the biology complex and Alpha 4 buildings were emphasized, what are the plans for other buildings? Mr. Petrie, who was there as uh, part of UCOR, 
uh, answered that not all facilities at Y12 are owned by engineering, by, I keep saying engineering, by uh, environmental management. Uh, and he noted that uh, uh, it's not only the high risk buildings, but also the ones which are feasible to get done under current funds. Another question, does the board have input on the prioritization of which buildings will be taken down? The answer was no, based on engineering decisions on which the buildings could be addressed with money that the environmental management receives. Mr. Petrie noted that uh, Congress can also earmark, earmark uh, funds for specific projects. Uh, there was a question on does the national park designation complicate things at uh, Y-12 and if any buildings would be saved? Again, Mr. Petrie stated he thought that one of the beta would be uh, uh, preserved as well as building uh, 9731. Uh, is there a plan to make Y-12 more accessible to the public? Uh, Mr. Petrie said that uh, that would be a question for NNSA. Uh, there was a question regarding uh, funding and risk issues for excess facilities, and Mr. Petrie stated that uh, when funding is available, uh, there's an ability to reduce risk and any funding would be stretched to do as much work as possible. Uh, there was a question regarding the molten salt reactor. Mr. Petrie said DOE has a study group that's looking at different options for that um, facility. Uh, there was a discussion on a possible recommendation for excess facilities, uh, quite a bit of discussion. Uh, I think the bottom line uh, was that uh, we would not uh, uh, make a recommendation in as much as uh, the uh, uh, excess facility uh, presentation is really a background for the uh, topic that we're seeing uh, uh, this evening and we'll follow up with the uh, uh, tour. Um, there was a lot of discussion on funding costs to demolish versus ongoing maintenance and possibilities to uh, refurbish, but again, no uh, agreement. Uh, the final agreement was that there was no uh, recommendation necessary. Our next meeting will be on the 25th. Uh, it'll be a uh, follow-up to the uh, waste uh, disposal capacity uh, presentation that we saw tonight and also uh, the tour. So that's the uh, EM and stewardship meeting notes. Thank you, Fred. Uh, following up on that same point, uh, those of you who have not signed up for the tour yet, please uh, notify Shelly uh, so that uh, she can get everything into security and get your badges. Uh, the other uh, committee report is the executive committee. Uh, there are two main topics that we talked about. Uh, Melissa already mentioned the annual meeting. Uh, there's a number of uh, issues that uh, we're uh, wrestling with. Uh, there was a, uh, several actions that came out of that, and Shelley has already followed up on some of that uh, already. That means in, uh, including uh, visiting the some sites over there uh, so to make sure that they're adequate uh, for our needs. Um, Belinda and I met with Shelley on the outreach presentation and uh, uh, gave her some good recommendations on uh, how to move forward with that so that we'll have that in place uh, for presentations to outside groups and, uh, and uh, school facilities. Uh, those of you that are interested in uh, that presentation or having that presentation made, uh, please contact us uh, about uh, your suggestions uh, or we may be able to uh, assist in the outreach or work with you uh, if you want to make that presentation yourself. Uh, with that, uh, are there any ad other additions to the agenda that uh, for this evening? Hearing none, um, are there any other topics that uh, people would like uh, to bring up at this point? With that, we're adjourned. What? Oh, sorry, what? Eddie. I don't have, I don't have a topic. Mm -hmm. I just have something I thought was interesting, which uh, I used to work for EM, so I probably know more than I should, but <laughs> no people. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of months ago, NNSA calls up Croat and says, hey, we want to use 1065 to, if, can we use that? And they said, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> certain materials that they wanted to put in there, they, Croat said, no. 
No, we don't want to do that. So NNSA does a, a roundabout, <laughs> go straight to the uh, secretary, and now they own 1065. So uh, <clears throat> it just seems if they do put this material over there, which is Pantax waste, the security, the all those things may, I mean, it would be harder to sell that property to for Croat to find a, you know, someone to, so I, I don't know, I just thought that was, because when Dave talked about <clears throat> the Hall Road and the NSA, um, they may wait at the last minute and say they want the Hall Road too. I mean, NNSA is, in, you know, so. I just thought y'all might, that's interesting, <laughs> what might happen there. I can add a, lot of, add a little bit to that. Um, it's been worked out. The, there are a collection of warehouses that NNSA has taken over management responsibility for. They're called the 1065 Warehouse, and Eddie's got it right. Um, they did at one point seek to take some uh, waste, I believe some waste storage boxes and store them there. And we asked as a condition of them receiving the buildings that they not do that for exactly the, out of the concerns that Eddie was raising. We, we think that it's just they've got other places where they can do that, and to keep that facility uh, in use solely for just general logistics made more sense. You know, desks, paper products, computers, whatever they use to run the Y-12 plant. So there will be equipment and things of that sort, but we actually built into the condition of transfer no, no storage of radiologically contaminated materials. Now, we made an exception for what are called sealed sources, which basically means they can have smoke detectors because we want them to stay safe. Stay safe. But the uh, prospect of them using it for rad material storage has been, has been taken care of. Um, it it did, um, did come up, but we did get it worked out. Now, across the street, there's another tract of land that they're using. Um, it's called the 3133 area, and you've heard me refer to it as the mini mega site. It's this big, flat area that hopefully someday will host some, you know, beautiful factory that provides a lot of jobs. But for, for the near term, about half of that site is going to be used by NNSA as a laydown area for the UPF facility that they're building in Bear Creek Valley. So they'll bring some materials in, lay them down there, and do some fabrication of things, not weapons things, <laughs> um, uh, building things, then we'll take it to Y-12 for use. There too, um, it will not be used for radiological materials. Um, in the case of the 3133 site, that land has already been transferred to Croet, so DOE doesn't own that anymore. Croet owns that, and Croet has basically complete control over what NNSA can put there or not put there. So, of course, Croat's going to watch out for Croat's interests, and Croat will uh, enforce whatever needs to be enforced to make sure that nothing happens that would reduce the marketability of the site. So I think we've got it worked out. Um, they're going to be present there for a while. They, they need a logistics facility. So in the warehouse area, they will be using three, there are five, let's see, five, 50,000 square foot warehouses there. One of them is actually only 25,000. They have taken ownership of three of them. Two of them are still owned by EM. Um, EM still uses them to store our own stuff, which actually is some radiologically contaminated <laughs> material, but we're going to get that cleaned up and shipped out. And then they have an interest in taking those two over also. Um, they will almost certainly have an enduring use for three of the five and possibly all five of the five buildings. But the bottom line is it will be uh, uses that are compatible with the economic development activity that's occurring around the site. So we got that one worked out. It was a concern, but it's, it's all we've found a way of teaming and making it happen. So Thank you both for the background and catch up. Anything else? Now we really are adjourned.
The Oak Ridge Reservation holds an important place in our nation's history, and it continues to be a vital part of our national security and scientific research community. But parts of the reservation require cleanup as a result of decades of energy research. The U.S. Department of Energy looks to the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board as the voice of the community on environmental issues. You're welcome to attend meetings of the Oak Ridge Site-Specific Advisory Board to learn more. Call us or visit our website.